Thank you, thank you, Gracia, and uh, thank you, uh, the organizer, for inviting me. Uh, so I have the difficult task today to uh, make transit exciting, and that's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, when people think about transit, they don't necessarily think about uh, something which is uh, exciting or high tech, and I'm going to try to do that. Uh, so this is uh, the outline of the talk. I'm going to start with some background and motivation, and then talk a little bit about what these on-demand multimodal transits, public transit systems are, and then uh, talk about three case studies that represent different uh, different uh, points in the space of transit systems. So some will be uh, you know, very sparse geographical region, very dense, and then a very large city. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we plan and we operate these systems. And then finally, we live in a COVID world. So I talk a little bit about resilience and how these systems would adapt in a, in a, in a, in a situation like we are living uh, right now. And then I'll conclude. Uh, so this is work with a, a variety of uh, uh, people in uh, three different continents, uh, at least two, two different continents. Uh, it started in Australia, it continued in Michigan, and then uh, it's uh, basically taking place at Georgia Tech. Now we work with transit agencies in every one of these locations, and you'll see the various case studies on these three locations. Uh, so let me start with the background and motivations, and I'm, I'm going to be very short here because you are in the space, so I don't need to... Uh, uh, talk too much about this, but mostly what we are trying to do is to see how we can uh, adapt the transit system uh, such that uh, it can give better accessibility to various population segments. And when I talk about accessibility, it's accessibility to jobs, to healthcare, to high quality groceries, and to education. And many population segments faced uh, hurdles to actually get uh, to their jobs or to this, these different services uh, in their daily lives. Um, now you're going to say, why is this difficult? Why is mobility for this uh, population segment so, so difficult? And I'm going to give you three slides to try to explain this. So this is where I live. This is uh, Atlanta. It's one of the worst um, uh, congested city in the world. Uh, if I take my car in the morning to actually go to work, I take about a uh, uh, bit, you know, if I take, if I go in the morning about eight or nine o'clock, I take about 15 minutes. It can go up to 120. Uh, an hour and 20 minutes. Um, if I do the same thing at 2 a.m., it takes me 15 minutes. Uh, so you're going to say, hey, why don't you use transit, right? Transit is nice. I love this picture that you see on the screen in the middle there. Uh, you see that the size, that the space that a bus is taking compared to the same space in the number of cars. Uh, so if everybody would be riding these buses, they would take you know a lot less a lot less space on the roads in the infrastructure, and therefore it would be a much better utilization. So what is the problem with transit? The problem with transit is this famous you know uh, first and last mile, and what you see on the screen at the right in the bottom there is uh, the share of ridership as uh, in terms of the the amount of walking time that people have to do to get to the transit system. And what this picture shows you is that if you have to walk a quarter of a mile, 400 meters, uh, you lose 90% of your ridership. You really need to pick people very close to where they live, you know, ideally uh, within 50 meters. Uh, so uh, so this, this is all the bad news that I'm giving you. So what are the good news? I think the big difference uh, compared to, let's say, two de decades ago is the fact that we can communicate with people, with infrastructure, with cars much better. Uh, so these telecommunication devices and infrastructure is, I think, the main enabler of many of the things that are happening uh, in the transportation space. At some point, autonomous vehicles will come. I will show you what kind of benefits they can have. Uh, and then the rest is essentially uh, IT and optimization and, and machine learning. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So let me tell you a little bit about these on-demand multimodal uh, transit systems. So from a system standpoint, from a transit agency standpoint, uh, this is a system which is multimodal, but at the same time on demand. So it has the rail, which is typically fixed route buses that are uh, going to be also fixed rod, but high frequency. Um, uh, so rapid bus transit, for instance. And then you will have this on-demand shuttle uh, that complements uh, these fixed routes. Now, when people see this picture, they say, yes, but what does it mean for me as a rider? How, how do I utilize those system? And so, and because we have so many of these questions, we have you know, prepared a little video that explain everything, what it means uh, from a user standpoint. And that's what you're going to see here.
So this is essentially the user experience, right? So the service is door to door essentially. It's a virtual stop such that we can do ride sharing, but it's essentially picking up people very close to where they live and bringing them very close to their destination. But it's also multimodal. We have buses, we have, uh, we have fleets of, we have trains and so on. And those uh, is what allow us to have economy of scale and fit inside the budget of the transit agencies. Uh, we can electrify everything entirely, so we, we're working very actively on this, such that the system itself has no greenhouse gas emission. And, and what I'm going to try to convince you today is that you can have a sustainable business model. It's the same price as a transit system. In Atlanta, it's $2.5, so it's an order of magnitude much cheaper than Uber and Lyft, and I'll come back to that when I'll talk about resilience in, at the end. One of the difference between micro mobility and what we are doing is that we are planning and operating this system completely holistically. It's not two systems plugged together. We are basically doing the planning and the, op, you know, the operations holistically. And, and once again, the goal here is not to make profit, right? So what we are interested in here is to have a societal impact, improving accessibility for many population segments. Uh, so let me go to the case studies, and this all started in Australia, so I'm going to talk about Australia. This is a picture of Canberra, that's the capital city in Australia, in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere, in the bushes. Uh, it's a city that was built by an American architect, uh, Walter Griffin, uh, based on the design principle of uh, uh, self-contained communities. Everything that you see on the screen there is like a little village. They have their own shopping centers, their own post office, and their own gyms, everything. It's like a city on its own movie theaters. Um, but they are separated by these green areas. So the city is very, very widely geographically uh, dispersed. And therefore, from a transit standpoint, it's extremely challenging. Uh, they had about uh, 120 bus routes, very long roads. And because of that, the frequency is very low. Therefore, the buses are running mostly empty and the system is very expensive for the city. And they came to us to ask, you know, can you do something different? And so what you see is the visualization of the on-demand uh, multimodal system uh, that we simulated for them. So the buses are blue. In this talk, all the buses are always going to be blue. Red are people waiting. Uh, you see a lot of people being, you know, uh, waiting at various points. And then the shuttles are green there. And so one of the things that you see there is that the shuttles are acting as feeders to these uh, bus stops, and then the buses are coming and they move to another location. You see these buses at the top there uh, going and picking up a lot of people who are waiting at the bus stops there. And then this bus is, is taking them to their next destination. Uh, you, see, you see somebody waiting there, that's a, that's, a, that's a virtual stop there. And you can see that the particular shuttle is gonna come and pick this person up and then move to a bus stop or directly to the destination. In this particular case, the destination was very close by. So that's how these systems are working. And once again, you will always see in many of these systems, the, the shuttle seems to be like busy bees, uh, but they really act as feeders to and from uh, the hubs uh, where the bus or the trains are uh, synchronizing with them. Uh, this is some statistics on the time uh, that we were able to reduce in terms of the transit time. So we basically reduce the transit time by a factor of two for them. And in this particular case, because the system was so geographically dispersed, we were also able uh, to decrease the budget by a factor of two, which was, uh, which was quite, a, quite a surprise for us as well. So this is a very geographically dispersed uh, city. Now what you're gonna see is just the opposite. So this is the, you know, uh, Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan. And the, there are two transit systems there. Uh, one is just run by the university system and the other one by the city itself. We work with both transit agencies. Uh, they are very well operated, uh, but it, they operate in a very, very small geographical area, like five by five uh, miles. Uh, for the, the transit system of the university. They have about 50,000 trips a day uh, and about you know, 7.5 million a year. To give you a sense, in Detroit, uh, you have about 70,000 uh, commuting trips a day. So it's a reasonable uh, commuting, uh, commuting uh, set of trips there. Not big, but you know, reasonable. It's used at 75% uh, capacity, which is higher than the average uh, in the United States. Uh, so this is uh, the existing system, one day in the life of this system. And at the University of Michigan, there are three, three different campuses. One is the North Campus, where you have the uh, urban planning and the College of Engineering music as well. Then you have the Central Campus, where you have almost everything else. Uh, the, the medical center is here. And then at the end, at the bottom there, you see the, the, the athletic center, and you know sport is big as Michigan. And so what you see is a lot of travel between these various campuses. The buses here, once again, the taller they are, the more people, uh, the more people are inside these buses. And you can see that there are various periods where they are heavily, very heavily used. And once again, red are the people waiting. Uh, this is 3,000 times the speed uh, of what is happening during the day. 
So what I'm gonna show you is before and after, the system as it is currently operated, and then the system that you can do with an on-demand multimodal system. So this is the morning inside this, the, this uh, university system. Um, you can see that the buses are blue and, and very well used on, in these corridors between the campuses. But when you go to the extremities of campus, you see these buses are almost flat there. There is almost no one in these buses. So you have this typical first and last mile issue. So, as soon as you get, get all side this, these connections between the campuses. And so most of the time you see these buses in those area and they travel empty. Uh, this is in the evening. In the evening, what they do is that they are actually uh, reducing the frequency of the buses. So the frequency is twice as long. And so now the, the students here that you see on the North Campus here, close to the College of Engineering, are waiting for a long time. So you see a lot of students now just waiting and waiting until the bus is coming. And that's because, so, so you have this trade-off now. Either, either you have a lot of buses, but they run empty, or you have you know, too few of them, and then the students are waiting. So none of these two situations are ideal. So what I'm going to show you is this, the on-demand you know, transit system uh, for the same data uh, in the evening there. And what's, once again, you're going to see all these shuttle there in green, uh, which are busy bees and connecting to, uh, connecting to the hubs and, and connecting people to the hubs or to their final destination. Uh, this is a dorm there that you see. This is the main uh, stop of the campus of the university. What is interesting here is that nobody is really waiting except at the, at the hubs. And the, the hubs, they wait about one to two minutes because the frequency of the buses is very high. So that's what, the, what, that's what these shuttles are basically capable of. They are actually uh, avoiding that the buses are running empty, but at the same time, they are servicing people quite well. Uh, this is a zoom on, on the North Campus here. And the one thing that I want to show you is that we do automatic ride sharing, right? So because of these virtual stops that I've shown you in the, in the, in the short video. So this shuttle is probably two or three people in there. It's going to drop them at the dorm there. This one is probably four or five people. This is a parking lot where they are bringing uh, these people. Uh, so you can see that, you know, this is a shuttle with a lot of people there. Whoops. And uh, once again, they were going to this dorm. So we do that automatically. Uh, so this is, um, this is uh, the uh, one of the shuttles that we use in a pilot. This was in April, uh, uh, two, three years ago. Uh, it, you know, you still have snow on the ground in April in Michigan, obviously. Uh, this is the waiting time that we had during that pilot. It's about, um, you know, three minutes in average, which is kind of, a, a kind of a really nice. Uh, some, of the, some of the waiting time at the end, uh, around 10 minutes, is typically at the end of the day. Uh, because the services would uh, finish at midnight and everybody would rush their, you know, uh, their final requests just before midnight. So it was always very interesting to see. Uh, this is some of the popular rides. Um, so you see, this is once again, what you see there is the, camp, uh, the, main, the main hub at the, at the College of Engineering. And what you see there are basically graduate students' dorms. And they are outside uh, the service of the transit system there uh, because this is one of the main roads in Michigan, it's a state road. Uh, route, road, sorry. And so a lot of the students would take their cars normally, but then they were, you know, instead they were actually using the, the you know, the on-demand system for actually commuting there. So a big mode change there that we observe. This is another very popular route. And that was very surprising for the people operating the system. This is a dorm, undergraduate dorms. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Steve Dolan, who was running the system, were very surprised because they have a direct bus line to go there. But, you know, the students would prefer to use the on-demand system. Once again, an interesting mode change um, that we had. This is the budget. We optimize the system uh, for waiting time. Uh, and so we fit inside the budget of the existing system. Uh, one of the things that we did is reducing the number of shuttle buses tremendously, but increasing the number of uh, shuttles. And most of the budget that you see there here is now uh, the drivers, the drivers of the shuttle and the drivers of the buses. So the day you have automated cars or automated buses, uh, the budget is going to shrink and you can improve quality of service or accessibility uh, you know, uh, substantially more. Uh, this is what would happen if we only use shuttle, even doing ride sharing, but only shuttle. And the budget would increase by a factor of about 10. And you would create some congestion along the corridors uh, between the campuses. So this is not a viable alternative. So you need to have this uh, consolidation. The buses are consolidating uh, the trips between the various campuses. 
So let me move to Atlanta, which is, uh, as I told you, where I live. And um, this is uh, this is a very congested city, as I told you. This is also a congested. Uh, this is also a city where public transit is a very small share of the commuting uh, for the people in the city and and around the city. It's only three point four percent. If you if you uh, compare that to Boston, where I think it's around 15, 17%, it's a big, big difference. Uh, the commuting time also by public transit are very substantial, uh, 53 minutes. So I was telling you before how long I would take uh, using car uh, during the rush hour. If I take transit, it would take me about an hour and 20 minutes. So it's even worse. Uh, I'm in an area where transit is not really uh, well covered. Uh, so this is the, the ridership, and one of the interesting thing about ridership in uh, in Atlanta is the people using the transit system are extremely loyal. So for every one of the station, every one of the lines, we can actually have this beautiful signature that are telling you what is the ridership at various times of the day, and they are they are really really consistent. So it's a very very uh, predictable ridership, and there is some variation, you know, from time to time, but it's very very minor. And so what you see there is uh, one particular uh, uh, rail station. Uh, these are the bus scout transaction uh, for uh, the bus breeze scouts when you, when you board a bus. Once again, very consistent across uh, different days. Uh, so the, the challenge for us was how do you design a system which is as large as this one? Because this is a very broad geographical area. Uh, there are multiple roads compared to the two systems I've shown you. They are, you know, you have the rail, but uh, you have the rail in addition and the buses. And we have to start having very realistic assumption here, for instance, in the number of transfer. We don't want too many transfer because people would be uh, not using a system if they have to transfer, you know, four times. And then the main challenge for us was computation. How do you scale what I've shown you uh, to the size of Atlanta? So this is one of the design that we had that you see on the right. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the assumption in a moment, but this is between uh, 6 and 10 in the morning. And once again, the, the blue there, uh, or purple, uh, I'm colorblind, so I never see any of these colors, right, uh, is the rail. And then the yellow and the red are the high frequency buses. And everything which is gray are the, are the, are the shuttle and the kind of trips that they do. And so once again, what you see there is that the way the design was done is basically saying that, hey, you know, you have to, ex the buses are expanding the rail, essentially. The rail is not very well developed in Atlanta. It's the backbone, but it could be expanded more. Uh, same thing for the, 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 the shuttle. They are really feeding into the buses or to the rail. Uh, in that period, 6 to 10 a.m., there are about 60,000 people every day. And so what we did was reducing tremendously the number of buses, uh, moving from 465 to about 26, but we have about a thousand shuttle. Uh, the cost is lower, uh, not much lower, but it's, it's lower. But once again, what we did was op optimizing over transit time, trying to make a difference uh, in accessibility. And what you see here is that we have essentially at this point a reduction in about 40, uh, 40 uh, 40 percent. These are for trips that are using buses. Uh, the rail trips are obviously uh, not benefiting from this. Uh, but everybody using a bus now see about a 40 percent reduction in transit time. Uh, so this is a simulation, and once again, you're going to see uh, you're going to see here. Uh, this is a very detailed simulation. Behind the scene, we are modeling how many people are in the buses, how many people are in the rail, how many people are in every one of the shuttles. Where the, you know it, it captured the frequency of the tr of the trains, the frequency of the buses as well. Very high fidelity uh, simulation. And once again, what you see is that these little shuttle are acting as feeder uh, to the rail or to the buses. Uh, and so this is. Um, uh, this is always very interesting to see. We are watching these videos, obviously, all the time. Um, so, um, so let me tell you a little bit how we do this. Uh, so the planning, the planning operation start with estimating the demand of the OD trips over time. And then we do network design and then fleet sizing. Every one of these aspects is very important. Uh, and then, and this is how you can actually start building these simulations afterwards. Now, during operations or during the simulation, uh, every 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 trip request is going to have a trip design, as, as you have seen in the video. What is the best route at this point in time uh, for this person? And then, you know, behind the scene, the system does real time dispatching, and then estimate where people will be at every one of the times, such that you can this, you know, you can plan the next uh, set of optimization. So I'm going to go over uh, uh, several of these these, um, these 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 optimization problems. Uh, the first one is the design, which is uh, which is very large. Uh, it's a very large scale optimization, and what we are trying to do is to decide where we open the rail and the bus line and with which frequencies. 
Uh, so we have a large number of hubs and we have to choose where we open uh, the bus lines or the new rail lines. In the particular case of Atlanta, you know, the building the rail would take too much time. So we only look at the uh, high frequency bus lines. Uh, the objective function is a combination of convenience and cost. So we reduce everything to uh, uh, cost, but convenience is a cost. And so we basically have an, a, an objective function, which is uh, optimizing both of them simultaneously. We can also uh, uh, include accessibility and trying to encourage people for certain areas, provide a certain level of service uh, for people in different areas. Uh, the optimization is inspired by traditional network design optimization, uh, which is, you know, uh, you had Anne Campbell before, uh, she, has worked on, uh, she has worked on this for, uh, for many years. It has difference, obviously, because we have these on-demand components and more dynamic components, so we had to do a, a number of in interesting things. But it's really inspired by, by the work that has been happening in the OR community in those settings. So the trips are modeled as single commodities, they may have multiple people. Uh, and then uh, we ignore in the first step the, the detailed routing and dispatching because that would be way too complicated. And we assume that we have enough uh, shuttles. Obviously, we have a fleet sizing, uh, fleet sizing uh, uh, module afterwards. Uh, and we have a, a very large number of frequencies that we can choose, uh, and we try to choose them optimally as well. Uh, so these are some of the decision variables, you know, uh, for trip R, are you using a shuttle to go from I to J, or are you using a bus to go from H to L, and which bus lines are you actually opening? Uh, this is the kind of MIP model that you start with. Um, this is the optimization problem, which uh, compute the, essentially the transportation cost and the fixed cost of opening the lines. You make sure that your network is reasonably connected, and that you can only use a bus if there is a bus, and then flow conservation. Now, this is a very large problem, uh, but the nice point is that it's amenable to nice decomposition. So if you fix the network, then it becomes a large set of a uh, shortest path problem. Uh, so what you can do is exploit that in a Bender's decomposition. You have to use you know, a lot of um, uh, tricks uh, to make it work fast. So Pareto optimal Bender's cut, cut bundling up using the structure of the problem, and then branch and check such that you uh, check uh, the sub problems all the time. Uh, so, you know, that's how you can actually start scaling to the size of Atlanta. We also use this concept of transfer graph. So because we want to minimize the number of transfer, but if you try to do that, uh, the sub problem uh, becomes, uh, uh, lose the totally modularity uh, property of, 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 you lose its totally unimodularity property and you have to use constraint shortest paths, which are much more complicated. But you can re, you know, you can actually redesign the entire network such that you encode inside the network the number of transfer that you do. And so that keeps uh, the sub problem uh, totally unimodular and you can use this cut shortest path to do that. Uh, so let me move to operations now. Operations is uh, what you would expect, right? So we optimize uh, over a rolling horizon. We batch the request and we optimize. We batch the next request, we optimize. Uh, the key question, obviously, is how to optimize. And this is how we do it. Uh, once again, you know, this is a service where we have to serve everyone. It's a transit system. So what we do is we operate on, uh, it's a column generation problem where we uh, optimize uh, over the routes uh, that we that we have, the, the shuttle routes. And uh, they may obviously have multiple passenger. Uh, so what it, so so we are basically choosing the routes so that we minimize waiting time. Uh, we uh, we serve every one of the riders and obviously uh, there is only one route per vehicle. Uh, we have a penalty there uh, to make sure that people don't wait too long and this penalty is, is increasing exponentially and that makes sure that nobody is actually left aside. So the, the cost of not serving someone is, ex is increasing exponentially over time. Uh, and therefore we keep track of the which riders have not been served and we increase their penalties uh, from one uh, time window to another one. Uh, the really difficulty in these problems is the, is the is the pricing problem. So that's a mid model of the pricing problem. And I don't expect you to understand it. I wouldn't even be able to actually tell you what it does anymore, uh, but it's very difficult because what we are doing is essentially minimizing wait time. And therefore many of the techniques that I use in vehicle routing don't apply uh, to this. Uh, so you cannot use resource constraint shortest path because the wait time, you only know it at the end. Uh, it's not practical to use time expanded graph here because you would have to discretize and it would blow up the, the complexity. So what we have done is having a dedicated branch and bound algorithm there to do that, which exploit a lot of the properties. And there are some beautiful theorems here that we can exploit. And we don't generate one route, we generate a set of route, disjoint routes uh, at every one of the, uh, during every one of the pricing problem. 
So let me show you a visualization. So this is on the data from uh, the taxi services in New York City. This is also the same algorithm which works on the Atlanta case studies that I've shown you. And so uh, once again here, the people waiting are red uh, and the more the taller they are, the more people they are. Uh, the, blue, the blue lines are um, uh, shuttles traveling with people inside and the green or red one, I never know, are the ones which are traveling empty. And so we watched this video and tried to see what was happening. Uh, it's very tough to actually get a lot of information from them, uh, but sometimes you have some interesting findings. So one of the things that I asked my students is at some point was to sh show me the vehicle utilization and you're gonna see something pretty embarrassing, right? So these results, and they are very good results using that algorithm. Um, uh, I'm gonna show you what they had as, a, as, as, a, as vehicle utilization. So the blue, uh, the vehicles which are not used at a particular point in time. So you can see, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the south end of Manhattan and at the north and the, and the north end, many vehicles are not used because it costs too much to actually reach out to them for uh, servicing a particular request. So we had to improve the algorithm, and what we did was actually using a combination of optimization, model predictive control, and machine learning. And so uh, this is done for relocating idle vehicles to the right places at the right time. And so, uh, so we essentially have two optimization at two different levels. One is the fine grain uh, real-time dispatching. The other one is more like at the higher, you know, coarser grain between the region where we relocated uh, uh, the, the, the vehicles. And this is inspired by uh, some of the uh, model predictive control algorithms that people at Berkeley have done. Uh, so this is the waiting time, typically an average uh, around three minutes. Uh, and so, uh, so one of the questions that people ask me all the time is that, yeah, you do ride sharing, but people typically don't like ride sharing. And I think two weeks ago, I was showing this picture to a talk that I gave to the OR Society in uh, South Africa. And they just interrupted me at that particular point. And they told me, hey, this is really what is happening in Africa, you know. And so uh, the point that I was making is that in practice, most of the shuttles that we have are actually not that busy. Uh, you can see here that the number of uh, passengers that you have, well, they don't have many passengers. There is not too much ride sharing. They are very busy about you know, 80 to 90% of our utilization. But they have essentially most of the time only one person in there, which is kind of interesting. And when I talk about resilience, this is gonna come back, okay? So uh, that's to give you a little sense of what we are doing for operations. Let me talk about resilience uh, because this is a question that obviously popped up uh, by, you know, Marta contacted us and what, you know, what should we do uh, in a context of a, of a pandemic? And so what you see on the screen is essentially the ridership that happened at Marta, uh, the, the transit agencies here in, uh, in Atlanta. This is, these are the rail uh, transaction uh, early in the months and then decreasing, decreasing, decreasing over time. Uh, these are the bus transaction, very heavy initially, and then disappearing entirely, uh, primarily because at the beginning, the buses were just not actually, the, the, the bus, uh, for safety reason, were not uh, asking people to, uh, uh, to, to swipe their cards anymore. People would go uh, and enter the bus at the, at the back of the buses. So uh, Malta currently doesn't, have, doesn't keep track of who is using the bus system. It's still there, but they don't keep track of who is using it. Uh, this is the design of the system before. Uh, this is the, the, the design of the, of the, of the Malta system with uh, the, uh, about 500 bus lines there that you see. This is what they are operating now. So they are operating at a very significant, uh, 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 it's a significant smaller operation, many, many fewer buses. Uh, this is a Malta station, you know, the other day when we, we tried to see if there were a lot of people, it was completely empty. Uh, but obviously, uh, in a city like Atlanta and in many cities around, you know, the country, transit is very important for, uh, you know, getting, getting to your job. Uh, and so the key question that people ask us is, what, well, how, how would a non-demand system behave in those settings? And this is important because uh, a lot of the people in Atlanta were complaining. Some of the people, you know, at no bus line, you see the, the, this person here. Um, and he, he essentially had to spend about $400 a month just to go to work, uh, which is a, a massive increase compared to what is, when he was using Marta. Uh, so, so, uh, so what we started looking at is how can we operate a system in a safe fashion during a pandemic? So obviously you need capacity reduction, you need social distancing in the buses and in the trains. Uh, you also to take into account that the demand is going to be depressed substantially, therefore there is a reduction in fare and budget. And so the key point is that can you serve that demand effectively? And so what I'm going to do is show you some scenarios here. 
of uh, that we analyze uh, both uh, before and I've shown you that already. But then at the early stage of the pandemic, then at the late stage of the pandemic, by late I meant uh, when you know Atlanta essentially closed out, and then. Uh, um, I'll show you one more strict uh, uh, scenario in a moment. Uh, one of the interesting things about the budget for Marta is that it doesn't depend as much as other transit agencies on fares. Uh, so it's only a you know, small part of the budget. Therefore, you know, we are a kind of a, 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 in a nice situation here. Uh, but we did experiments with other transit systems as well, but I won't have the time to talk about that. Uh, so, uh, sorry. So let me show you the, 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 the scenarios that we look like. So this is the baseline that's what I've shown you before. Uh, we had this shuttle of about a thousand, a thousand uh, fleet. And then for the other scenarios, we are reducing the capacity of the buses, the, the, the amount of riders that they can accommodate. Uh, in the strict scenario, we basically not use the buses. Um, and then you see a reduction in the rail capacity as well. So using a quarter of you know, the passenger in a particular, in a particular uh, 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 wagon and so on and so forth. Uh, for all the shuttles, we only use one person, so such that we are safe inside the shuttle or as safe as we can. Um, yeah, so let me show you this scenario. So this is the one which is the early pandemic. Uh, so we stayed within the budget and uh, by reducing the number of shuttle to about 80, 87, uh, 800, some, you know, 880 shuttles, we were able to keep the same running time and fit inside the same transit time and stay within the budget, uh, which was, you know, nice to know. Uh, this is inside the late pandemic, the demand there is very significantly depressed. And once again, we were able to keep the same uh, time. And this is uh, when we had a very strict pandemic settings where uh, we would not even use the buses. And once again, what you see there is that the shuttles, they were about 600 of them and they really fit into the rail, but they, they, they now have much longer trips than usual. But once again, we were able to fit inside the budget and, and have roughly the same uh, transit time. So these systems are somewhat resilient. You can reconfigure them quickly such that you, you fit inside a budget for this particular setting. And yet you can uh, keep some reasonable quality of service uh, compared to the baseline that we started from. So that was interesting to see. So let me conclude now. I think I'm, I'm, I'm almost at the end of my time. So, uh, so what I'm trying to, to, to tell you is that you can design you know, on-demand multimodal transit system that address this first and the last mile problem. And the way you do that is that you focus on the on-demand part only for the first and the last mile. And then you consolidate the ridership uh, and use, uh, use you know, fixed bus lines, uh, rapid bus lines, and rail for uh, providing economy of scale. And the hope is that we can provide a much better service, a much better accessibility and reduce uh, transportation inequalities, uh, which are quite large in a city like Atlanta. Uh, so the key finding is that these systems are applicable in different settings, uh, even in a complex city like Atlanta, uh, which, is, which is nice. So it doesn't depend too much uh, of, the, of the kind of transit system that you have. Obviously the design is very different in these different settings. Uh, the bus the bus lines are very very short in uh, uh, in an arbor they are much longer in a city like Atlanta to connect to the rail. Uh, the key technology is predicting ridership reasonably well network design there is a lot of planning that we have to do and then uh, some real-time operations. Uh, there are many challenges ahead and I think they are, they are somewhat similar to the one that um, uh, David was talking about about the bicycle before and and I will mention one. Uh, they are very different, of course, but they're also very similar. And I will mention one, which is a typical thing that the transit agencies are worried about. And, um, and this is what if, what if the, the system is successful? What if adoption increases? How can we predict the demand? And so what we are doing is uh, modeling this as a stacker burst game, right? So you design the system and then you see what people are doing and then you start having this feedback loop between the two. And so... Um, so you have to you know, model what people are, are going to do based on the quality of your transit system. And that depends on the transit times, on the number of transfers, on you know, whether you use a rail or a bus and things like this. So we are trying to model that. So this is a picture, right? So you design your transit system and then the riders are deciding, am I using this or am I using you know, my car or am I using you know, my bike or something like that? And so we have to design this system globally. And so in a sense, what you have is that uh, you have a discrete choice model or you know, uh, a machine learning model inside your optimization. And that's extremely complicated from a computational standpoint. So, uh, so what we are designing now is algorithm for 
doing that, and they are typically this uh, bi-level optimization problems with very dedicated combinatorial cuts. Uh, this is one of the design that we did for the Anaborixilanti region. Uh, the region that you see on the right here, uh, basically a, an area which is really poor and not that well served by transit. And we are trying to see if we can, by having a better transit system, increase adoption. And so uh, we were able to show that, you know, we, we can increase adoption by about 10 to 15% for these people by just redesigning the system based on how they would react. Uh, so that's what we are doing. It's very complex from a computational standpoint. So uh, um, if you want a very good topic to work on computational issues, this is one of them. Uh, and I think the next talk today is going to talk about some of this as well. Uh, so that's what I wanted to tell you. If you want to know more, uh, we have a nice website where some of these results are described. And obviously, I will be very happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you very much.